Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. We're on a series, Connect the Dots, and uh, you know, it's the, when it comes to the Bible, everything, the, the Bible's two sections, I kind of talked about this at Easter, the Bible's broken up into two sections, an old section and a new section, and a lot of understanding the old section, it, it hinges on understanding the purpose of the old section, and it, all through the Bible, all through this, this old section, what we call the Old Testament, there, there's these stories, <clears throat> we want to call them uh, kind of a lower and an upper story. Now, I'm not a writer, but I have a family member who is a writer, and <clears throat> she uh, actually have a couple family members who are writers. My daughter, by her fifth, I think fifth grade, had already written a 150-page novel. <laughs> and it's like... Like, what's wrong with you? Like, what? Like, who does that? And Monica's actually working on a book right now. And yeah. And someone asked me, are you going to write a book? And it's just like, no. <laughs> I would have to write to write a book. I'm going to go golfing instead. <laughs> yeah, you should have cheered there, guys. Yeah. But it's broken, broken up, in, in writing there's this thing called an upper story and a lower story. And a lower story is kind of the immediate circumstance set, or the, uh, that, that immediate context of something happened. But an upper story is kind of this broader context of what's happening uh, in the overall plot. And when it comes to the Bible, there's lots of lower stories that by themselves can, even, can be hard to understand. But when you take it, when you understand the upper story, then, then you can realize, then you, you start to see the bigger picture of why these stories, why these stories exist. And, uh, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, one of the things you have to understand is that the, the, the purpose of the Old Testament is, was to point us to Jesus. That was the purpose of it. That's the whole purpose of everything in a nutshell uh, of all these stories, they, they were to actually point us to a coming Savior. And understanding the role of the Bible is important because if you try and make the, the Old Testament into something it wasn't intended to be, that's where you can get into, that's where you can get into confusing questions. And so it, it, the, the purpose is to point us to a Savior, that, that, that a Savior's coming. If you, if you want to Get a, hear a message that has a lot more about that. The Easter Sunday message is downloadable online. And, and it, I just I go into that in depth. I don't have time to do that today. I want to go into one of the stories that, that uh, kind of where God introduces himself to people for the first time in a, in a big way. And it was the, after the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they were gathering at this mountain called Mount Sinai. And at this mountain, Moses, uh, God instructed Moses, Moses, I want you to get all these people ready. I, I, I'm going to come down and I am going to reveal myself to them in three days' time. You can read this in Exodus 19. I'm not going to read it because it's 15 chapters long and that's all we would do for the next 30 minutes is read it. But you can, you can read it on your own. And out of, what happened is that the, the people prepared themselves and then... For two days, and then on the third day, they gathered around Mount Sinai, and the presence of God began to, to come down the mountain in thunders and clouds and earthquake and scary things. And the people freaked out. They, they, they literally said to Moses, uh, tell you what, why don't you just go talk to God, and you can just tell us what he said. 
And we're, we're happy with that arrangement. We don't like this thunder and lightning and shaky, shaky. It's just not, it's not what we're digging. So they said that, digging. And uh, <clears throat> so Moses went back up the, the mountain. This is where the Ten Commandments came from. Um, this is, uh, Moses went up, God, God spoke to him. Moses, actually Moses and Aaron had gone up the mountain. And um, the, the Ten Commandments, it, that's kind of the, the big ten that we know. It was actually hundreds right. that it's 15 right. yeah. chapters yeah. worth wow. of commandments yeah. that came down. Right. That there's a reason he was up there 40 days. It yeah. took that long to write it down. Like it's, and uh, what happened was that uh, there also out of this came this set of instructions for building uh, a dwelling place called the tabernacle. It's a very comprehensive set of instructions that, uh, that Moses brought down with him. And, and uh, this, this tabernacle, it, it's, uh, it was a place where God would dwell with his people. Right. But the problem was is that God could not dwell with them all, it, it, at 100%. Let's say, say he could not, so the, this, this temple was, or this tabernacle was divided up into areas where God's presence could be um, because uh, God's presence would kill people. So <laughs> at the, uh, the, uh, what, what it, it was broken up into three major sections. One was called an outer court, and this is where all the sacrifices took place. There was an altar there. Uh, the second was a holy place, which was a place where there was... Um, like the altar of incense, there was the, the candlestick, and there was uh, a table where bread was kept. They called it shoe bread. I don't think it tasted like shoes, but it was. And uh, then there was, this was called the holy place. <clears throat> and then there was one more section, and this is where God's presence was, and it was called the holy of holies, or the most holy place. And what was it kept in there for all of you Indiana Jones fans? Yeah. That was where the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the thing with the two, the cherubs with the two big wings facing each other, and it was all gold, and it was, it was carried on poles, because if you touched the Ark, you died. And so it, it, it's a big deal. You didn't, just, you didn't just grab the Ark and run. Like, you grabbed the Ark and you fell to the ground. It was yeah. all, all over for you. And the, the, the story as it goes here is that, you know, the, the lower story is that there's this, this tent that is made, but the upper story is the, from the very beginning, God has wanted to be with his people. God could have just kind of managed things from afar, but that's not the way God wants to do things on the earth. Yeah. He, he wants to be involved in the lives of his children. He wants to be a part. He wants to be around them. And so, um, you know, the lower story is there's a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of, uh, a lot of things that had to happen. God was among them, but there's barriers. Right. And uh, God was not accessible. As that basically came down to God wasn't readily accessible, and the, uh, the you know the the this holy of holies had a curtain between the holy place and then the, there was the holy place and the holy of holies, and between the two there was this curtain, and a priest could only enter into that room once a year, and it was very important that he he did it. There was a lot of things he had to do to go in there and not die. And if you didn't do it all right, like you had to put like the blood of a lamb on your left ear, on your left elbow, I think on your left toe. And, and it's like there couldn't even be a stain or perspiration yeah. <laughs> on his garments. You imagine, how do you get ready for that knowing that if there's perspiration, you'll die? It's like, I'm dead. It's just like, <laughs> I'm going to die. I, I know I would, I, I sweat when I'm frozen, like it just, I would die. That's, but if you didn't, if you didn't do it all correct, but the, the upper story is that God wanted to be with his people and dwell amongst his people. And that you got to remember that this is old story. It's pointing towards 
a bigger story. And that story's name is Jesus. And so Jesus came to divide, to break down those barriers so that God could be among us. And something very significant happened. When Jesus died on the cross, there was, if you watch the video at Easter that I had shown, there was an earthquake that took place, but there was also something else that took place at that exact same moment that was very significant. And it was in, it was in Solomon's temple which had replaced the tabernacle by that time. And that, that temple, the most holy place, had this curtain between uh, the holy place and the holy of holies. There was this curtain. That curtain was three feet thick. I think it was about 50 feet wide and about 70 feet high. I could be wrong on my dimensions. I probably am. But, but it was big. You get the idea. Like a three foot thick curtain. And it was made of like furs and different, different stuff. And when Jesus died, that curtain from the top to the bottom ripped in half and that barrier was gone. And what it showed is that the, the barrier to God's presence ripped from heaven to earth. In other words, God took the initiative to tear apart that barrier between God and man. He had taken the initiative. And so the, the, God wants to be with us. God wants to be with his people. And there's, this, this happens two ways. God dwells in us personally, but it also happens that God dwells in us corporately. And, uh, you know, personally, you know, we went from this uh, Ark of the Covenant, this Holy of Holies, this Ark of the Covenant, you touch it, you die, to actually where Paul said, don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? So we went from a temple, a built temple, to you are actually the temple now. You are the Ark of the Covenant. It's, it's in you. God dwells in you. When, you. when you follow him and believe in him, that his presence dwells in you, but not just you. It says that God wants to dwell in us corporately as well. And this is where Jesus said, I'll build my church. And wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there with you. Right. And so there's something that God wants to do in us, in us as individuals where we experience his presence. But there's also something that he wants to do in us together where we experience his presence. And so this whole subject of God's presence, there's a lot of confusion around around what this means. What does it mean to live in God's presence? Do, do I feel his presence? You know, do, how do I know that... How do I know that I'm in God's presence? And, you know, what do I do to have his presence? And, you know, I don't even know what some, it's like, I don't even know what that means. And others, it's like you, you've got a very strong idea of what that means. And some of you would answer, well, if you read your Bible, you meditate, you sing worship songs and you pray, well, then you'll, then, you know, you'll be in God's presence. And, and uh, you know, if you have feelings, but what if you don't feel anything? What if there's no feelings at all? What if you go your whole Christian life without feelings? Does that mean you're not in God's presence? Because some people never have feelings. So does that mean that God doesn't love them? Maybe you didn't keep enough rules? And, you know, maybe you grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. You're in trouble. You know, I think that sometimes... There's a lot of confusion around what it means to live in God's presence. And uh, we're going to look at that. I think some of you might have an aha moment today about what that means. So, you know, when Moses came down, he brought this thing called the law, which is hundreds and hundreds of commands. But the, uh, when Jesus walked the earth, he took all of those commands and he crammed them into two. And he was, Jesus was asked, what, what is the most, Matthew 22, you can follow along on the screen there. It says, teacher, this, uh, this is Jesus being questioned. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. 
These two commands are pegs, and all and everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. These two things, everything hangs on these two things. Love, the, love God with all your passion, prayer, intelligence, with all your mind, all your strength, all your energy. And the second is love others as well as you love yourself. And this is what Jesus said, everything in that, that, that whole Old Testament, it's all summed up right there. The whole thing is summed up in those two statements. And from that, we learn, we learn a couple things. Is that one, God, God wants to dwell in us personally. Yeah. Love the Lord your God. It's personal. Yeah, it's true. That's personal. That's you and God. That's, right. yeah. That's vertical. That's just be, there's no one else there. It's between you and God. And, you know, a lot of times... A lot of times we can, especially if you've grown up kind of in the traditional church world or you have some church background, it's, it's like there's a lot of emphasis placed on that you and God aspect. Yeah. And you, if you've grown up, especially if you've grown up in, a, in, an, in an environment where the rules were really important, you know, it, it, this, this almost turns into, instead of loving God, it actually turns into keep the rules. You know, don't mouth off your parents. Don't disrespect them because dishonor your mother and father and it'll go bad for you. And so it turns into these, it, it really turns into instead of being a relationally oriented thing, it kind of turns into a rule oriented thing. And then you start asking questions like this. This is, it. you know, if you've grown up in this environment, if, you've, if you recognize this, is like, well, is this a sin? Is this okay? How far can I go before I sin? Well, that, I, you tell me a world about yourself when you ask those questions. Because that, sh that shows me what you, were, what you were taught. Is that you were taught following God means you're obeying a bunch of rules. And not as much relationship, just rules. And... and uh, I can hear some of you thinking, well, what else is there? Well, let me ask you this question. Who obeys you? Who obeys you? You know, does you, maybe your dog? Your cat definitely doesn't obey you. Who obeys you? You know, we, what makes someone a good friend? Well, they obey me. <laughs> what makes, you know, a good, you, some of you young of dating age people, what makes a great boyfriend or girlfriend? Oh, well, well they do what I say. <laughs> like, there's something wrong with this, isn't there? You know, when you say of your spouse, it's like, why are you, you know, I have a great wife. She does everything I say. I say, she obeys me. Now I obey her. <clears throat> Not even close. You know, there's something about functional relationship that we know that obedience is not the criteria for healthy relationships. Well, why would we think that God is looking for obedience when he is the author of all relationships why would we think that it's obedience that makes him happy that it's obedience that makes us good i think maybe god's looking for something more than just blind obedience and this you know this vertical relationship with god is important reading your bible praying meditation these are important parts of that vertical relationship with God. But there's times you can do all of that and still feel like there's something lacking when it comes to living in God's presence. And I just want to say this, it's because you're only completing half of the picture. That's only half the picture. The other is that God wants to dwell in us corporately. 
and that God wants to dwell in us together, that, that our gathering is important and, and uh, how we relate to one another is important. And our relationship with our relationship with an invisible God's not so much how we carry out this long list of rules, but it actually is measured against how we live in relationship with one another. And Jesus talked about this. In fact, I, I dare you to go to, prov- or to, the, to the Gospels where Jesus taught and find me stories where he doesn't talk about how we relate to one another. It's just full of relationships. It's, it's all sorts of matters of faith that, that our relationship with God is not separate from the way we treat other people or the way we think or the way we talk about other people. Jesus said, if you're going to bring an offering to the temple and you know that your brother or your sister has something against you, he said, put your offering down and go be reconciled to your brother and sister and then come back and make your offering. Don't tell me Jesus didn't consider relationships a part of our faith. The way we relate to one another is as important as the way that we relate to God. And this is, this is uh, you know, when, when, when Jesus died and that veil split in half, that was actually not an individual only thing. That was a corporate thing. That, that veil, that barrier between God and his people, corporate, was broken. And so I think we all, I think we all kind of know fundamentally there is, there's something wrong with the faith that has a place for us to be right with God, but mean to people. Like, when, when we look at, a lot of times what incenses us is when someone, someone makes a comment, well, you know, I'm a God-fearing person, and then they, they treat people with contempt, or they marginalize groups, or there's something in us, I think, that just naturally reacts to that and says, that's not right. That's not, like, you shouldn't be able to say you're okay with God, and then being a jerk yeah. to someone next to you. There should be something wrong with that. We all, it, it, I think it's, yeah. We're. <laughs> Words. <laughs> and this is what John, the disciple of Jesus said. And this is a, he wrote this at the end of his life after he had had a lot of time to think about what Jesus had taught and what Jesus had said. You know, the early church it took them years to figure stuff out. It took them years. A lot of people say, we just need to get back to the way the early church was. It's like, no, we don't want to do that. That would be a bad idea. They had messes. They had big messes. They they were figuring this whole thing out. Jesus dropped a bombshell on them. Going to have a church. You 12. You're going to be in charge. And then three years later, Adios. (laughs) Adios. <laughs> Just do it in the world, guys. See you later. Like it's, it took, there was, and so this is where John's talking about this whole thing of relationship with God, of living in intimacy and living in fellowship with God. And this is what he says. We know, 1 John 2, 3, we know we have joined him in an intimate relationship because we live out his commands. Okay, well, we're back to commands again. Let's give me a minute and we'll come back to that. (laughs) If someone claims I'm in intimate relationship with him, but this big talker doesn't live out his commands, then this individual is a liar and a stranger to the truth. But if someone responds to and obeys God, obeys his word, then God's love has truly taken root and filled him. And this is how we know we are in an intimate relationship with him. Anyone who says, I live in intimacy with him, should walk the path that Jesus walked. It's a very important statement right there. Anyone who says, I live in the light, but hates his brother or sister, is still living in shadows. And anyone who loves his brother and sister lives in the light and will not trip because his conscience is clear. 
anyone who hates his brother is in the darkness, stumbling around with no idea where he's going, blinded by the darkness. We know, verse 3 there, it says, we know we've joined him in an intimate relationship because we live out his commands. Well, let's just drill right back. What did, what was Jesus' commands? What did he command? Love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and love others like you love yourself. That's what he commanded. Those, those are the commands that he gave, is to love. And so... Anyone who says, I live in intimacy with him, should walk the path that Jesus walked. Well, what was the path that Jesus walked? It was a path of relationship. It was a path of love. It was a path of compassion. It was a, it was a path of caring. And uh, yeah, if, verse, uh, or, sorry, I'm getting confused. I have so many things I want to say. And so little time to say them. Verse 8 and 9, it says, Whoever says, I live in the light, but hates his brother or sister, is still living in shadows. And, you know, there's sometimes you might say, well, I don't hate them. I just would prefer not to interact with them at all. (laughs) You know, hate's a super strong word, but how about contempt? How about... You know, I don't hate them, but if I never saw them again, I'd be okay with that. Well, is that love? No. Is that love? It's not walking in love, obviously. And so the way we relate to others actually determines the amount of light that we live in ourselves. And, you know, Jesus was questioned by a, a religious teacher, and he was questioned, and he, you know, he's, you know what's the greatest command? And, was, and Jesus turned it around and said, well, what do you think the greatest command is? And that, this, this teacher gave exactly the same answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you're right. Now, just go do that. And this guy, kind of self-smug, he, he had his vertical stuff in order. In other words, he kept the rules. This was a religious teacher, and he could keep the rules. But it, you know by his next answer, he wasn't so good at the people part. Is that He said, well, who is my neighbor? And this is where Jesus, Jesus said, and this is in Luke chapter 10, if you want to read this on your own sometime. Jesus said, well, how do you interpret it? When you read the scripture, how do you interpret it? See, your neighbor will depend on how you interpret what it means to really live a life of love. Yeah. And if, if it's just going to be follow the rules, well, then you're not going to have any neighbors. Right. But if you, if, you, if you live by the law of love, you're going to realize that everyone's your neighbor. Wow. We're, res- we're responsible for everybody. And so that's not... And let me just say something about neighbors. Neighbors are not confined to nation states. All of humanity is a neighbor if your interpretation is one of love. And where we get intolerant is where our interpretation becomes one of less than love. And 1 John 2.10, anyone who loves his brother and sister lives in light and will not trip. But anyone who hates his brother is in darkness, stumbling around with no idea where he's going, blinded by the darkness. You know, living in light, this, this phrase, living in the light, living in an intimate relationship with God in 1 John 2, they're kind of used interchangeably, is that... John is saying walking in intimate relationship with God is not just about us and God. It's about how we live with others. And I want to just say sometimes our relationship with God, we you know, we get the vertical part taken care of, but then we ignore the others part. And then we wonder why 
why we feel like we're not fully walking with God. And for some of you, some of you, you come into the house of God, but you're, you're like Jesus said, you might need to put down your offering and you might need to go make something right with somebody else. Maybe a family member, maybe an associate, because God puts equal importance on the vertical and the horizontal. He puts equal importance on the way we relate to him and the way we relate to others. And to walk in God's presence, you have to walk in the light as he is in the light. And verse 10, anyone who loves lives in the light. When you choose love, you live in, you live in the light of his presence. Traditional Christianity spends a lot of time emphasizing just us and God. But when we look at all through the scripture, all through, especially in the New Testament church, there is a tremendous amount, equal amount of emphasis on how we relate to one another and how we, how we love one another. Let's stand. We, we experience God's presence in our lives to the, to the equal and same degree that we dwell with others in love. And I guarantee you, if bitterness gets in your heart, it'll affect every area of your life. It'll, it'll bring darkness. And so I want to, if we be so bold as to pray a prayer like this today, is to ask God to make us people that are right with him, but also right with one another, and to have the courage to take the steps to make those relationships right and strong. Let's, let's pray together. You can put your hand on your heart if you want, and just pray, Jesus. I thank you that you took the initiative so that I could be right with you, so that I could dwell in your presence and have your presence in my life. And I pray that you would give me the courage to live a life of love, to live a life of right relationships, of valuing others, of loving others just as much as I love myself. And I pray that you'd give me the strength fix relationships that need fixing and to bring healing where it's within my power to bring healing in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. You guys. And I know, you know, I know the response to a message like that isn't easy. It's those, I, I sometimes hate messages like that because me and God are okay, God and I. <clears throat> but I know that others and myself are not okay. And that is getting in the way of my vertical relationship. And so for some of you, it'll take courage. It'll take making a phone call. It'll take a step. You say, well, what if they don't respond? You know what? Sometimes the response isn't the important thing. That's right. Sometimes it's our initiative yep. that's the important thing. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.